All right, it is uh, Ask the Surgeon. Welcome back to Health Matters. Joining us again, our guy, Dr. Jeff Mason from Everett Bone and Joint. We're going to talk about cartilage regeneration. That's right. What, That's okay, right. first of all, here's the million dollar question What does that mean? Well, speaking orthopedically, there are lots of different types of cartilage. And cartilage makes up a lot of these different soft tissue components that are within and also support your joint. But normally when people talk about cartilage, what they most commonly are talking about is what's called hyaline cartilage, and that's the stuff that covers the end of your bone. So when a joint is moving, those two bones, what is articulating, what is the two things that are rubbing against each other, let's say the end of your thigh bone, the top of your shin bone, that is covered with articular cartilage. And the articular cartilage, just to kind of take it uh, one step further from a physiological standpoint, it's very unique in the human body, and it has, uh, you know, high high resi- resistance or resilience, but it has poor rejuvenation. Exactly, it's really astonishing material. A normal human joint has less friction than any man-made system that's been devised, and yet when cartilage is damaged, it has very little regenerative power. So much so that I tell patients that articular cartilage is barely even living tissue. So if you get some divot in it, the divot's liable to be there forever. And for many, many years, the cutting edge of orthopedic surgery has been in trying to figure out ways to repair or regenerate articular cartilage when it's injured. Uh, an example of what happens when it's injured badly and you can't do anything about it is you get a joint replacement. But we're trying to think of ways to keep that from happening so often. So the uh, um, is this happen? Here's another stupid question: in the knee or just anywhere that? Well, it can happen in any joint, and okay. certain joints, because they're not uh, weight bearing joints or whatever, can get substantially damaged and demonstrate very few symptoms or no symptoms. But in the major weight bearing joints, you know, the knee, the hip, the ankle, and then you also see it in the shoulders, of course, um, when the joints wear out and the articular cartilage is damaged or absent, you start getting lots of symptoms. That's what arthritis is. And and again, just going back to the type of tissue that it is, uh, when it's damaged and it doesn't have the ability to repair itself, and the reason it doesn't repair itself is a lack of blood supply. There's no blood supply and there are very few cells in it and the cells are not particularly active. So it's just this hard cap of this resilient tissue that sits over these joints, and it's there for a protective reason to slide and glide. Yeah, although it's not particularly hard. I mean, if you you know feel it with a probe or with a you know a gloved finger, you're always amazed at how soft it feels. It, it really is almost astonishing that it lasts as long as it does. So, so is there the latest breakthrough in cartilage regeneration? Well, there's not so much the latest breakthrough as there's a constant evolution and improvement. I mean, initially what we would do if the cartilage was damaged is you could drill holes in the bone and try to get fibrocartilage, which is not so effective, but works a lot better than nothing to fill in these holes. Then there are systems where you can actually take a patient's cartilage and culture it and essentially grow grow your own cartilage and put it back into the joint. That can be effective. We also do plugs where you can actually take a plug of bone and cartilage from either the patient or another patient and fill whole, holes. And those are, that's sort of the current state of technology. But a lot of these things with you know, the PRP that you hear about um, and things that are being worked on both in this country and overseas – Everyone knows that the eventual solution will be biological in terms of trying to make your tissue regenerate itself. And are you talking like stem cell research and and taking cells out of the patient, growing it in the lab, and then putting those cells back in that divot and that cartilage you're describing? Well, there is a process where we do that already, and that works pretty well, but it's limited. But what you're you're talking about is, um, ideally speaking, is instead of actually growing your own cartilage, putting something into the knee that will make the cartilage heal itself, okay. and, that, and that's, what, that's what's being worked on. And we're definitely not there yet, but um, every year there, we're farther along, and I think it's the kind of thing that we're, it's not going to be off in the, the, you know, the distant future where this is achieved. Well, Didn't th- Colonel Steve Austin, $6 million man, have that already? or did they uh, just- Yeah, I think he might have had it in several joints. Yeah, okay. good job. You know, I mean, what's interesting is this is a huge need because as a physical therapist, I mean, I see several patients, I mean, throughout the year that are, you know, that 45-year-old athletic type person that probably has a little divot in their cartilage and they have these symptoms. Tell us about the symptoms. What do people that have these 
Cart Lazen's deficits, how do they approach to your office? Well, um, a lot of times people will say, gee, the more I do, my knee gets sore, it gets achy, it swells up a bit. Sometimes they have symptoms of catching or grabbing, but not typically. More often they just say, gee, if I don't do much, my knee is pretty good, and if I do more, it, you know, it, it gets worse. And you can get MRIs or other studies, or sometimes you perform an arthroscopic procedure and you see these areas where you say, well, wait, you're... Your cartilage in this area is badly damaged. It's thin. It's absence. You're down to bare bone. And if this is a patient who's old enough, you say, gee, you need a new knee. But if you're too young or too active, that's not a solution. And uh, Shannon highlighted perfectly the people that are frustrating, the ones who are younger. If someone has a knee that looks that way in their 70, you say, guess what? You get a new knee, and that will work well. But if you're 35, you say, well, that's not a good option for you. What can we do? And hey, we're limited. And, and, and but you, you're talking about uh, potential for this uh, growing this tissue is is it sounds like it's it's out there or is, or is it being done in Europe? I mean, I know right now you're doing some things, but it sounds like there's stuff on the horizon that's going to be promising. Well, Europe, I believe, is a little bit ahead of us. They have fewer restrictions in stem cell research than we have in this country, um, but also I think their medical uh, situation is regulated differently from ours and. Uh, when you see these athletes going overseas and having this or those that procedures, you know, sometimes it's snake oil, but other times it's not. Mm -hmm. And other times they are a bit ahead of us. Um, when they're doing the uh, the various systems where they take some of your own blood and they spin it down and take these or those elements, it's very complex because your blood has dozens and dozens of different factors in it that promote or decrease inflammation, that, and that either promote or decrease healing. And... It's, it's a real puzzle to try to figure out which ones you want to perform this specific process, and that's what people are working on. And which is, so when you hear that Kobe Bryant has some injection in his knee and it made him feel better, now there may very well be something to it. Mm, interesting. You, you mentioned something earlier about, uh, so as a, as a physician, or orthopedic physician, you're going in there with a the scope and you're going to look around, and if you see that um, divot or that, that chunk of cartilage that's either missing or been knocked out or damaged or worn out, you drill holes around that. Is You're describing a microfracture surgery. That's exactly what I'm describing, yes. Tell us about that. Well, microfracture surgery can be very effective, um, and basically what you do is you're drilling holes into the bone where the cartilage is absent, and you're trying to get uh, the knee to bleed locally in that area and form a clot and regenerate and stabilize the area with fibrocartilage, which mechanically speaking does not work nearly as well as the cartilage is replacing. But when you get a good fill-in, patients tend to do well. But it's been shown that mostly they do well in the short to intermediate term, and they may have a great improvement in symptoms for quite a handful of years. But if you start looking at how they're doing, you know, four, five, six, seven years down the road, a lot of times they'll say, gee, it was good, and now my symptoms are starting to come back again. Interesting. So as a, as a surgeon, when you go in there and, and you're drilling those holes, how do you know or <clears throat> How can you tell that that's filled in with that clot and that fibro cartilage? Well, to some degree, you don't know. And, and w you drill your holes, and you'll watch the blood start to ooze from these holes and form a clot in the site of the microfracture. But then at some point, you know, you get your scope out of the knee. Um, a lot of times, the typical post-operative protocol is lots of motion but no weight bearing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, professional athletes, they'll sit around in a – continuous passive motion machine for this many hours a day and just their knee just moves back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and it's obviously not the world's most exciting treatment um, but those what you're trying to do is uh, the motion can stimulate uh, the you know the formation of the cartilage cap too but you don't want the stress of uh, weight bearing on it so that's usually what we do afterwards to one way or the other how about you know the um, the new uh, I saw LeBron uh, working out on some sort of um, running device that is no weight bearing whatsoever. Have you seen that? Oh, he was probably on one of those running systems uh, that um, decompresses. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Holds them up yeah. and stuff. And sometimes <clears throat> uh, that is some of the, those athletes sometimes have some low back pain or they're trying to get some motion going and they're trying to like Dr. Mason was talking about limit the weight bearing or kind of the compression through the joint. So yeah, those are unweighting systems. They're out there. You know, a lot of times we see them for people that have back pain that almost need traction effect, and you want to kind of give them some aerobic activity, but running and compression is going to irritate them. So the uh, cartilage regeneration we're talking about, does that is that going to uh, progress in the future where 
um, that will help as far as like stopping like total joint replacement or this is kind of is the bridge. I, I think if it if it's truly successful, it should substantially reduce the number of joint replacements that are done in the future. Yeah, and it's uh, a huge That's need because I mean uh, one of the biggest uh, populations that seems frustrated in my world of physical therapy is again that 35, 45 year old, 50 year old worn out, slightly worn out knee. But again, like Dr. Mason was talking about is too young or too early for some kind of replacement right. and needs a five or 10 year. Right. Situation. I mean, if you, if you look at the, st- the statistics on, cho- on total joint replacements, you know, those surgeries can be a bit of an ordeal to go through, but generally speaking, they are highly successful and really change people's lives dramatically for the better. But what we're looking for is what do we do for the people who are, are not old enough for that or won't right. benefit from that yet, and just the, the type of people, because the world's full of people who have this or that high school injury or some other mm-hmm. trauma or whatever, and they're very much, you know, even on the young side of middle age who have a bad joint, and they're very hard to deal with right now because the technology is not yet there. We can improve them, and sometimes we can help them a lot, but you always feel like you want to do more. Yeah. Let me ask you, in your experience, and just uh, give me your opinion on, on this scenario. Um, a young athlete, high school, early college, has a meniscectomy where you have to go and remove a certain portion of that meniscus. And that meniscus, as we all know, is pretty important, that knee joint. When you take a part of that meniscus out, does that athlete or that patient become more susceptible to wear and tear and this, these cartilaginous uh, defects? It depends entirely on the size of the meniscectomy. You can take, depending on where you take it from, even a substantial part of the meniscus, and biomechanical studies and clinical studies suggest that you're not really doing any harm. However, if you take too much, Absolutely, it will lead to increased stress, increased uh, transmission of force across the joint, and more rapid degeneration. And the worst case scenario, that can be fairly rapidly accelerated. So, I mean, what's interesting, uh, as you describe it, as a surgeon, then I would imagine that's kind of a, a decision that you're looking at. So when you're going in there to fix that knee, you're thinking about kind of the present concerns, but also you have to look at the future problems. Yeah. I'll, when I have patients in the operating room, I'll tell them, I say, if I think I can repair your meniscus, even with the chance that this, because those surgeries, sometimes they don't work because that tissue has such poor healing qualities. But I tell patients, I will fix it if I can. Even if it doesn't work, it's better than just blithely removing too much tissue. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of times I'll tell them I'll do what I would do if it was my knee. Well, I'm I'm old enough that they that may not be true anymore. <laughs> but but nonetheless, um, that's pretty much the attitude you have. You say I'd rather subject a patient to another procedure down the road six or months or a year from now if this doesn't work than just to take out their meniscus and throw it away. But does it get to the point where if they keep you know tearing their meniscus that you have to you know replace it? Yeah, but meniscal replacement is something that's you have to be a can you have to be young enough and slim enough and have little enough damage in the other joint and it's very technically demanding to the point where in any state for example you only find a handful of surgeons who regularly do them the mm. surgery's been likened to putting an oyster back in the shell oh mm. wow yeah and, Sounds and, difficult. and so it's, it's technically demanding and you know the results are well they're a lot better than nothing but they're certainly not what anyone would like yeah how, how come no one has developed some kind of uh, synthetic material um that you can just go in and kind of sew or patch over that that cartilage problem. It's constantly been worked on, and just finding this the right material has been very elusive. Human body is pretty special. Yeah. When it, when you when you look at just that cartilage yeah. covering these joints. If, if your body is on your side, you've got it made. <laughs> if it's not, you've got good problems. luck. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good luck. I wonder how many times Joe Namath has had this kind of stuff done. To oh, him. those guys. He's probably got a total does knee. Does he have a total knee? I yeah, would I, imagine. I, without knowing specifically, I bet he does. Yeah. Maybe even both yeah. of them. But, I mean, like. Uh, but Dr. he get, does kind of walk a little gingerly, though. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know what? Um, <laughs> you, know what's, you know what's interesting, though, is uh, when I first started in this field 25 years ago, I mean, they were not doing total knees, for example, unless you were like 60 years old or even 65. Yeah. And now you are more comfortable doing totals, and even partial knees are kind of, you know, the new wave uh, of an intervention when that joint is worn out enough that it requires Yeah, that. if you can do a partial, that's better yet. Right. If, if the joint is amenable to that, that's a good solution. And these, these patients that have these um, joint 
uh, replacements, either total or partial, or activity level is quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually one of the reasons you try not to do them in patients who are too young because all of a sudden you have someone said, gee, you know, I, I, I reentered the mogul contest after you replaced my <laughs> knee, and you're saying, oh, geez, that's a, that's a mechanical device. You right. Know, it it right. only has so many, so many revolutions in it. As right. Well. Yeah, interesting. Cartilage. Joe Namath. Yes. Bilateral at the same time. All right. Knees in 1992. Oh. Well, so you see almost heard for... it here first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so nice see, work, Tom. Is he due for more then? Well, at some point, he very well may be. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, this is how we're going to have Overstreet over 80 with this kind of uh, technology breakthrough. Yeah, the by then, they're going to be growing something and just injecting it in your knee. It's no, going to find its way to that. It's that Star Trek, you know, where they're just going to shoot you. Bones was his name. Bones. Yeah. Oh, he always fixed fine. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more information, go to everboneandjoint.com. Dr. Jeff Mason, thanks a lot for coming on with us, as always. Thanks.